Our final keynote presentation from Claire Casucci from Frontier Advisors is going to talk about that from a very interesting perspective. Claire has actually worked in financial advice and the, the retail end of the market. She now with Frontier is talking to the very big end of the market and she's going to talk to us about how those big clients approach portfolio construction and what relevance that might have for the retail and financial advisor market. So please welcome Claire Casucci from Frontier Advisors. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's, uh, you know, I'm always excited these days to be uh, back at real in life uh, conferences. And I'm really excited to share about the, you know, some insights on portfolio construction between uh, big institutions and private wealth. Uh, so I'm a senior consultant at Frontier. I advise a range of clients across superannuation, long tail insurers and university endowments. And I also do research into hedge funds. And uh, before joining Frontier, I worked as a financial advisor for a number of years. And I even did a stint as an auditor. So I have seen everything in the market. And while I was a financial advisor, the business I worked in actually transitioned to managed accounts as well. So I've worked under uh, different advice models too. So Frontier may not be a familiar name to everyone, so I'll just give a very brief overview of what we do. Uh, so we're asset consultants, which means that we provide investment advice to big institutions. Or as I like to say, it's financial advice with lots of zeros. We were set up in the early 90s by the industry super funds to provide them with unconflicted investment advice. So while our heritage is very much based in industry super, over the past five to 10 years, we have been uh, leveraging off our expertise in that area to share our investment experience and knowledge with a broader range of institutional investors, such as insurers, charities, endowments, foundations, and also independent financial advice licensees. So uh, that's a new area for us and we're, we're pretty excited about that. So Frontier doesn't manufacture its own products. Um, we don't have our own investment products or anything like that. We only make money from our advice and subscriptions to our technology platform. And what you'll hear today is just some of my, my insights from working across both institutional and private wealth clients, how they're similar, how they're different, and areas where I think each can add value. And in the interests of disclosure, I'll let you know that Frontier is owned by four industry super funds. I have personally been a satisfied member of industry and profit for member super funds for over 20 years. And the two funds that I'm currently a member of are advised by other consultants. So let's have a look at these two portfolios. I've compared the average my super portfolio with an SMA from my old shop which I'd say is fairly typical across the market. Now, at first glance, the portfolios from big super funds appear to be pretty similar to what you would get from a financial advisor. They've both got a similar return target of around CPI plus three and a half. Both have similar growth defensive profiles of around 70-30, similar equity exposure, similar asset classes. So on the surface, there isn't that much that appears to be different. But now let's compare the different constraints that a big super fund has to deal with compared to an individual who is investing their own private wealth. And here you're getting a lot of differences. So while an individual investor is virtually unconstrained in what they do and how they invest, Big super funds have significant constraints that they need to operate within. And it's often these constraints that drive some of the key differences that we see between big super funds and private wealth portfolios. So let's take a deeper dive. So as public offer funds have increased in size, this has led to more scrutiny. 
not only are regulators increasing oversight and requiring more detailed and more frequent reporting, there's also more inquiry from politicians, the public and the media. And this increased scrutiny and increased regulatory burden has been just one of the factors contributing towards fund mergers because you need scale and staff to deal with all of the additional compliance. And I'm sure that many people in the room can appreciate what compliance burden looks like. So you can see on the left-hand side that fund assets have increased significantly since 2015. Yet on the right-hand side, we see that the number of APRA regulated entities has been steadily falling. Now, interestingly, the assets within SMSFs have been more or less stable, uh, but their numbers have been increasing over the same period. So individual investors just don't have this level of scrutiny. As advisors, you certainly face regulation in the advice you provide, and some investment structures like SMSFs have regulation around them. But the underlying investor themselves faces little regulation in where they choose to invest. If they want to gear themselves up to the eyeballs and put it all in Dogecoin tomorrow, there's nothing stopping them. SMSFs have a bit more regulation and rules, but in many cases, so long as an investment is permitted in the trust deed and the investment strategy, and rules are followed around gearing and personal use, then you can pretty much do what you like. Now, on the whole, regulation appears to be benefiting big super funds. While they're not perfect, their track record of strong performance with few scandals along the way has made them an attractive choice for many investors. Now, superannuation funds have to report their fees to APRA, and these form a component of the annual APRA heat map. APRA cares a lot about the total level of fees paid, with net of fees performance being less of a focus. This makes it very difficult for big super funds to invest in expensive strategies, even if those strategies provide great after-fee returns. So in expensive sectors like alternatives, you'll see fewer funds invested in hedge funds, especially those that charge traditional 2 and 20 fees. And it's also unusual to see really large allocations to private equity. Now, there are exceptions but you'll notice that these funds always have to justify their higher fees in the media when, when they're at the top of the list of expensive funds. Investment teams at big super funds are expected to deliver reductions in their fee budgets year on year, and this is taken very seriously at the most senior levels. Big super funds have a huge commitment to delivering value for members, and for the most part, they've been pretty successful at it, and total fees have been falling over time, as you can see from the chart above. When I see the fees that big super funds pay for external managers and compare that to the rack rate that's available to retail investors, the value they deliver on fees is clear. However, fees are also an area where I would see private investors without fee constraints as having an advantage over the institutional super funds because individual investors can decide where they see value for money and allocate accordingly. As advisors, you also have scope to articulate why paying a higher fee might be justified. For example, you might recommend an active manager over a passive manager and justify the higher fee with potential for alpha generation. Or you might justify the inclusion of a more expensive alts manager as providing access to genuine diversification away from traditional asset classes. Now, that doesn't mean you should load up your client's portfolio on expensive alt strategies, but it does perhaps provide you a bit more scope to increase allocations relative to the big super funds. Now, the other one that's gotten a bit of airtime today is liquidity. And it may seem somewhat counterintuitive uh, that big super funds have constraints around illiquidity, and yet they have meaningful allocations to illiquid assets. Whereas private investors have no constraints around illiquidity, and yet the portfolios that are designed for them are usually entirely liquid. 
So while super funds and private investors both invest in sectors like infrastructure and property, private wealth portfolios are almost entirely invested in listed property and infrastructure, whereas big super funds are invested almost entirely in unlisted property and unlisted infrastructure. And in Frontier's experience, the typical my super balanced option would have a strategic weight of around 25 to 30% in illiquid assets. And the difference is a function of investor appetite, lessons learned, and also access. Now, I started my professional career in February 2008 and spent my first year sliding down that slope of hope as markets fell, then capitulated and left everyone with a really big mess to clean up. And judging by the grey hairs in the room, I think a lot of you probably shared that journey with me. Now, one of the major lessons that came out of the GFC uh, was around investor appetite for illiquid assets in a market crisis. Now, I'm sure many of us have had the experience of sitting in front of a client who swears until they're blue in the face that they're a long-term investor, and then as soon as there's a market crisis, they want to pull everything out and put it in cash. And that happened a lot during the GFC and resulted in many illiquid investments, such as unlisted property funds, freezing redemptions. Now, I was still dealing with the fallout of the APN Property for Income Fund number two when I left private banking at the start of 2017, almost a decade after the GFC started. So as a result, portfolios that are created for individual investors today tend to only invest in highly liquid assets. If an investor does want illiquid assets, they're usually left to buy their own residential investment property or suburban commercial property building. Now, big super funds have been able to maintain illiquid allocations as their appetites for illiquidity have rarely been tested. Even in a market crisis when some more engaged members might switch to cash, super funds still have dollars coming through the door via compulsory contributions which means they're almost never under pressure to sell assets to fund switches. Now, COVID-19, an early release, was the closest big super funds have come to liquidity problems. And despite some scaremongering in the media, they pretty much passed with flying colours. Not only did they still have contributions coming in, they had lots of other levers to pull to access liquidity if they needed it. Now, just for fun, I used Frontier's proprietary portfolio modelling system to analyse the illiquid exposure of the average MySuper portfolio in a GFC-like scenario where they had 45% member redemptions in the space of four months and no money coming in through contributions. Now, even in this extreme and unlikely scenario, which is the most severe stress test that our system has built in, the portfolio barely breaches a 50% illiquidity threshold. So there's little concern that the average super fund will run into liquidity problems even in a market crisis, which means that they can harvest the illiquidity premium available in the market. And lastly, big super funds can access, can invest in unlisted property and infrastructure because they can get access. These types of investments often have really high minimum investment amounts. You know, minimum tickets of 10 to 20 million or more are typical. And most overseas managers don't have Australian dollar hedged vehicles. So it actually relies on a big institutional investor having the ability to invest offshore and manage its own currency exposure as well. So unfortunately, this particular investment market is just not very good at catering to private wealth. Now, one thing that illiquid holdings can lead to is a lag in valuations relative to listed markets, and this has been touched on earlier today. Uh, but I've got here some charts of listed versus unlisted property and infrastructure to illustrate this. Now, valuation infrequency definitely results in a smoothing out of returns relative to listed markets. But in terms of whether this is actually a big problem, I would suggest not. It's swings and roundabouts. 
So for every time that unlisted valuations hold up when listed markets fall, there's a reverse situation where they take time to catch up when listed markets rise. And over time, we've observed that listed and unlisted markets tend to follow each other fairly closely. In addition, all of the big super funds have valuation policies that set out their rules for valuing illiquid assets. And likewise, the underlying managers have valuation policies that state their methodologies, and these are reviewed carefully on a regular basis. And in fact, one of the jobs that's on my plate at the moment is I have to go through and review the valuation policies for hedge funds that my clients are invested in and confirm that those valuation policies are acceptable. So, based on what I've seen, big super funds have robust policies in place and they're not getting an unfair advantage through lagging valuations. Now, we just had a great session on ESG just then, and it certainly sounds like things have progressed since I was an advisor. Um, out of all of my high net worth client base, which was about 60 clients, I had one that cared about ESG, and he gave us a list of fossil fuel companies that he wanted excluded from his portfolio. But regardless of an individual investor's ESG views, they just don't come under the same pressure that an institution does around ESG. And when I started working in institutional investments, I was really surprised at how front and centre responsible investment is. ESG considerations permeate all of my research and all of my advice. And it is a core focus for all of our clients on all of their investment options, not just their SRI options. And it's really no surprise. If a big super fund invests in something considered undesirable by someone or another, they will be pilloried in the press, cancelled on social media, have protesters outside of their building and be subject to significant external pressure from special interest, group, interest groups to divest from whatever it is that's caused offence. So even though the regulator only requires super funds to have a strategy around ESG and to consider climate change, external pressure now means that the way they deal with ESG issues is high stakes and a huge consideration in everything that they do. Now, in my experience, instos will use the full spectrum of responsible investment levers available to them. And in particular, their size means that they can get in front of management and boards and use their ownership stakes to require and affect change. And small individual investors just don't have that clout. In addition, instos are big enough that they can get investment managers to tailor a portfolio that meets their particular needs whether that's excluding some investments they don't like or favouring ones that they do. So one institution might have more concerns around carbon emissions or another on faith-based issues like adult entertainment. And those institutions are big enough that they can target those specific areas. And as an example, um, I've collaborated quite a lot with James Harwood, who was on the previous panel, to tailor a strategy to meet a client's particular needs around climate change. So my observation is that private investors tend to be more focused on exclusions rather than trying to affect change via engagement. Individuals tend to have passionately held values that they want reflected in their investments as opposed to pricing ESG risks into valuations and investment decisions. Let's face it, the average private investor is not doing their own valuations on AGL or Woodside and pricing in their carbon transition risks. Individual investors are also more product takers than product makers. So ESG products on the market might need to cater for everyone from vegans to climate activists to religious requirements. So they'll often just have an extensive exclusion list that's not necessarily targeted to a particular need. So even though ESG is a constraint for institutional investors, I would actually say it's a real area of strength for them. Now, both private investors and big super funds appear aware. It might just look 
a little bit different. So I'm sure we've all engaged in a barbecue stopping conversation about our investments and sneakily compared how we're doing financially relative to our friends. But peer awareness between private investors is often no more high stakes than a bit of friendly rivalry and occasional feelings of envy or superiority. Big super funds are also highly peer aware with a mix of formal comparisons and market forces driving their increased awareness. So when industry super funds were first established, they were very closely aligned with particular industries. And that usually meant very pronounced demographic differences between funds, which would then be catered to with differentiated investment strategies. However, through choice of fund and mergers over time, a lot of those industry characteristics have diminished. They still persist in some funds. Uh, I think Hester and Cebus are, are good examples, but it's certainly less pronounced. As funds have more similar member bases and competition has increased through choice of fund, that has led to greater peer awareness and in some cases a reluctance to stray too far from the herd. And regulatory requirements like APRA heat maps and Your Future, Your Super have made peer awareness high stakes. So while regulation has driven some positive change, the blunt tools they use do incentivise herding and can lead to more passive management. So size. Size does matter. And there are a lot of benefits to being big. Size means you can drive down costs, negotiate lower fees with managers, do more sophisticated and interesting things, which then gives you the opportunity to attract more and better staff. On the flip side, size can introduce complexity into your business and potentially erode culture. If a big super fund is internalising its investment functions and doing more sophisticated stuff, Arguably, it's insourcing business risk. One of the great strengths of industry super has been a member-first culture that has been dearly held and fiercely guarded since its inception. And that culture is relatively easy to promote and maintain when you've got a small and committed staff. But as super funds grow and internalise, they're having to recruit from sectors that have a lot more, that have been a lot more commercially driven, like funds management and investment banking. Or even when they're setting up offices overseas, uh, they've now got international staff who might not understand Australia's industry super system and its motivations. So maintaining that healthy member first culture becomes more difficult and it's an area where super funds are devoting considerable resources to try and preserve it. Size can also make it difficult to invest in some capacity constrained sectors, either because you might swamp the market if you try or it makes it harder to be nimble if you need to change your portfolio quickly. So some big super funds have opted out of investing in areas like small caps and emerging markets altogether, um, although some still do maintain allocations. For private equity, venture capital and hedge funds, in order to make meaningful allocations, often a big super fund has to invest a small amount across a lot of different strategies, which means a lot of line items in your portfolio leading to increased monitoring burden. Instead, a lot of the mega funds are using their size to go direct in the private equity market and taking direct ownership stakes in companies and even taking them private. In some cases, the mega super funds are outgrowing Australia and they're having to source new investments from international markets that are big enough to absorb their growth. So this need for nimbleness and dealing with scale is what has led many big super funds to internalise some of their investment functions. It's much easier to invest more money if you control the team and the process rather than needing to source more capacity from external managers whose strategies may already be fully committed. 
So there is actually a lot of potential for private wealth to add value by investing in smaller and more niche markets that may be uninvestable for the big players. Again, you're not going to have a portfolio that contains only these things, but you might carve out a portion of your equities allocation to dedicate to small caps or emerging markets. So big super funds have been notably successful investors for a long period of time. And aside from their investment returns, they've got a lot of data at their fingertips and they're adept at anal analysing their members, understanding member demographics, understanding cohorts and member behaviour. So where can financial planners add value in the face of these sophisticated behemoths? Well, from my point of view, having worked across both sectors, it's the personal relationship you get to have with your clients that is the big differentiator. Relationship is the reason for being for any successful advisor. And big super funds can't compete with the personal touch. You know your client. And you don't just know your client's balance sheet. You know their values, aspirations, needs and concerns. You know their kids' names. You know what they're up to in life and how their investments contribute to that. Your clients trust you. They ask you if, you if they should do A or B. They trust you when you hold their hand through a market crisis. And they're better off when they hang on rather than selling at the bottom. They trust you to help them figure out this difficult and complex investment world and make choices that are in their best interest and will help them achieve their objectives. You can provide your clients with tailored advice, and not just about their super investments, but about a contribution strategy, about repaying debt, budgeting, Centrelink, perhaps investing in their personal name or their family trust. You liaise with their accountant to help them get the best structuring and tax outcomes for themselves and their business. There is massive scope for you to add value over just how their super is invested. And when it comes to super investments, you can help your clients figure out whether they want it all taken care of by their industry super fund, and you can just help them with a contribution strategy, or whether they want that greater level of control and involvement in investment decisions. Or maybe they want to invest in areas that aren't catered for by public offer funds, like having their own business real property in an SMSF. And on top of all this, you can provide a personal service and make sure that stuff gets done and isn't missed. Helping with things like filling in forms and arranging an intent to claim a tax deduction is actually really valuable. So play to your strengths and be confident in the areas where you can add value. And seeing as I am at a managed accounts conference, and I personally had a great experience dealing with SMAs when I was an advisor, I'm going to wrap up with a plug for managed accounts being a great fit for this relationship-centric model of advice as well. When you're not having to worry about producing ROAs every two minutes or focusing on the operational minutiae of doing a transaction on a RAP platform, it does allow you to spend more time building a relationship with your clients and finding strategies and solutions that genuinely meet their needs. And let's face it, the fun part of being an advisor is the time you spend with your clients. It's not the paperwork. <laughs>